Empathies. This course is approved for six hours of QME continuing education by the Division of Workers' Compensation. This is your author and narrator, Dr. Perry Carpenter. I hope you enjoy the program. Hi, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join me on this video. In today's discussion, we're in part two of our new series entitled Permanent Impairments of the Tendinopathies. And in this program, we're exploring all the various tendinous degenerative conditions that examinees and injured workers can present to us in the California Workers' Compensation System. And we're talking about how to provide for permanent impairment ratings for these conditions, which will likely never, ever return to pre-injury condition. It's interesting because the AMA guides themselves do not provide for permanent impairments directly for tendinopathies uh, anywhere in Chapter 15, Chapter 16, and Chapter 17 of the AMA guides. But these conditions do uh, leave examinees with permanent impairment and reduced function. And so we're going to explore uh, how to provide permanent impairments for these conditions, both under the strict application of the AMA guides and then also by analogy under Almarez and Guzman. And I have a fascinating program for you today. But before we get into today's discussion, let's just briefly review uh, some of the topics that we discussed in session one. In session one, we defined tendinopathy and we provided some statistics on the incidence and prevalence uh, of tendinopathies in the uh, workplace and industrial settings. And we stated that like the likely incidence of these conditions is likely underreported with many examinees and many employees receiving uh, no consideration at all and no medical treatment and no reporting of their painful conditions. And so it's very likely that many, many more workers are experiencing pain due to tendinopathy than are actually being reported. And then we went on to uh, trace the development of the tendon structures of the body from the embryonic mesoderm. And we found that uh, all connective tissues of the body derive from the embryonic mesoderm. And we ended our last session with a cursory introduction to the connective tissues of the body. And we're going to continue today by uh, further exploring the uh, connective tissues and then settling in on an in-depth discussion of the anatomy of the tendon, which is one of the connective tissues. And this is important for you to understand the anatomy of the connective tissues in general and the anatomy of tendon uh, tissue specifically, so that when we get into a discussion of degenerative tendinopathies, you understand just exactly what it is in the tendon structures that degenerate. And we'll go into that into uh, great detail. So uh, with no further ado, let's continue uh, today's discussion, which is session two of our new program entitled Permanent Impairments of the Tendinopathies. Now, all of the connective tissues of the body consist of three main components. And what distinguishes one connective tissue from another type of connective tissue is the type and amount and consistency of these three main components. So all connective tissues consist of cells. All connective tissues have some type and some quantity and some arrangement of fibers uh, within the tissue. And they also have some type, some quantity, and some consistency of what's referred to as ground substance, also sometimes referred to as extracellular matrix. So, for example, if we consider two connective tissues, say, for example, tendons uh, and perhaps bone, well, both of those are connective tissues. They both derive from the embryonic mesoderm. And both of those connective tissues each contain cells. Bones contain cells. Tendons contain cells. In bones, we call those cells osteocytes. In tendons, we call those cells tenocytes. 
both bone and tendons contain fibers and uh, in tendons we call those fibers collagen fibers and also in bone we call those fibers collagen fibers both tendons and bones contain extracellular matrix or some form of ground substance in bone the ground substance and the extracellular matrix becomes calcified and gives us that hardened hard as bone substance whereas in tendons the ground substance is more liquid is more flexible is more fluid and so uh, bone of course is both visibly and functionally different from tendon but they share anatomically same similar uh, backbone in that they all they both have cells they both have fibers and they both have ground substance and all of them are immersed in some quantity uh, of fluid environment within the ground substance now this is important here to understand the anatomic makeup in in today's program uh, specifically with regards to tendons it's important that you understand the cellular anatomy the fiber anatomy and the anatomy of the ground substance because each of these represents an area wherein the tendon can go bad wherein the tendon can become degenerative. We see changes in the cellular structure in tendinopathy. We see changes in the fiber structure in tendinopathy. We see changes in the ground substance structure in tendinopathies. So let's talk before we get into tendinopathies and the changes that take place in each of these structures, let's further develop the idea uh, of these connective tissues so that you're firmly uh, familiar with these concepts. So let's take a look at each of these uh, components individually and let's begin uh, with the various types of cells that we see in the various types of connective tissue. And as we're going to see, each of the connective tissues have their own distinctive cell type, but all of the cell types are derived from the same embryonic progenitor stem cells, which then go on to differentiate into each of the specific types of connective tissue cells so for example uh, the fibroblasts fibroblasts are the cell types the immature cell types that are found in the fibrous connective tissues such as tendons and ligaments and these derive from the embryonic stem cells chondroblasts on the other hand uh, derive also from the embryonic stem cells and they become differentiated into the type of cell that produces the structure that we become familiar with in uh, the form of cartilage. So these cells differentiate to produce different type of fibers and different type of ground substance that produces what we know as cartilage as compared to what we know as uh, tendon or ligamentous tissue. But again, these uh, connective tissue cells all derive from the same embryonic progenitors. They simply become differentiated into specialized cells that then go on to uh, produce the specialized type of connective tissue. Uh, osteoblasts, these are found in bone. Uh, the mature cell found in bone is known as the osteocyte. The mature cell found in cartilage is the chondrocyte. The mature cell found in connective tissue is the fibrocyte. And these blast cells are the immature cells that set up the structure of bone, that set up the structure of cartilage, that set up the structure of tendon and ligament. And it's the mature cell, the fibrocyte, the chondrocyte, the osteocyte, that then maintains, that maintains the mature fully formed connective tissue structure. Hemocytoblasts, these are the cells found in blood. These uh, type of cells produce the red blood cells, produce the white blood cells, produce the uh, dissolved fibers that are found in the plasma. The dissolved fibers are the fibrinogen and clotting factor fibers that then come out of solution to produce the clotting uh, fibrin, fibrinogen, 
that is responsible for the clotting of blood. Again, the hemocytoblasts uh, derive from the same embryonic progenitor cells. And then in connective tissues, we also see uh, some accessory cells that uh, migrate through the connective tissue, such as white blood cells, plasma cells, macrophages, mast cells. And I have a diagram in just a few minutes to show you. Uh, one example of connective tissue, uh, we're going to look at the uh, loose areolar connective tissue, and we will see some of these various uh, accessory cells migrating through the loose areolar connective tissue. Now, like many other cell types in the body, tendon cells, tenocytes, have cell-to-cell -cell communication through specialized structures in the cell membranes. And cell-to-cell -cell communication in connective tissues is important and specifically important in tendon structures because cell-to-cell -cell communication is what's going to be responsible for the maintenance of the integrity of the tendon uh, as a whole. And also it's going to be important in the degenerative process of the tendon as a whole. So for example, in uh, building up tendons, in tendon development and in tendon strengthening, Tendons respond to anabolic sig signals, such as uh, anabolic signals delivered through exercise or through rehabilitative procedures and physical therapy. These anabolic signals are communicated from cell to cell to cell throughout the structure of the tendon so that stress applied to one location of the tendon can result in anabolism or tendon buildup in another part of the tendon, and this is a useful feature that can be exploited in physical therapy, but also degenerative catabolic signals uh, where a tendon has been injured in one area. Unfortunately, these anabolic signals spread throughout the entirety of the tendon through these cell-to-cell -cell communication networks so that when a portion of the tendon has been injured and becomes degenerative, unfortunately, the entire uh, tendon structure becomes degenerative through these cell-to-cell -cell communication uh, junctions and pathways. And these pathways are known as gap junctions. So let's take a look at the microscopic anatomy uh, of these communication networks or gap junctions. So here we have a diagram that depicts uh, a couple of cell types uh, in close communication with each other. And this is not tendon tissue. It looks uh, more likely to be uh, epithelial tissue, perhaps uh, epithelial tissue lining the uh, inner lining of the small intestine in the uh, duodenum, for example, uh, as these look to be like uh, columnar epithelial cells here. But anyway, uh, this demonstrates uh, the concept that these adjacent cells have connections where the cells come into close proximity and these connections uh, provide structural integrity and also provide a means for communication between the interior uh, of one cell with the interior of another cell. So there's many types of these uh, cell to cell connections. One of these uh, cell to cell connections is known as the desmosome. So this here is a blow up uh, I'm sorry, this is a tight junction. This is a tight junction. So here we have a blow up of a tight junction. And you can think of these tight junctions as sort of like uh, snaps on fabric, where one piece of a uh, snap comes together with another piece of a snap and you press the two together and they closely close and provide a tight, secure attachment uh, held together by the snap. So these are interlocking uh, junctional proteins that provide structural integrity and strength uh, to this section of the cell membrane. Uh, another type of cell-to-cell -cell connection is known as the desmosome. And this is a blow up here of the desmosome. The desmosome is composed of uh, linker proteins on one side of a cell membrane with linker proteins on another side of a cell membrane and this sort of interdigitating uh, protein skeleton network and matrix that provides a tight and secure attachment from one cell to another cell and this provides structural integrity and strength 
uh, thereby fortifying uh, these adjacent cell membranes. You can think of a desmosome as sort of like a spot weld that brings uh, two pieces of metal together to provide uh, structural strength to those two pieces of metal. Well, of concern to us with regards to cell-to-cell -cell communication in adjacent tenocyte tendon cells is the gap junction. So here is a blow up of the gap junction. And let's take a look at the gap junction uh, blown up uh, even larger. So here's a diagram uh, of a blow up of the gap junction. And the gap junction is composed of these embedded proteins within the phospholipid bilayer of adjacent cell membranes. And so we have a embedded protein here. We have an embedded protein here. And these embedded proteins have a channel allowing communication of chemical substances to flow from the interior of the cell membrane of this cell to the interior of the cell membrane of this cell. And then the same thing happens on the adjacent cell. And the th same thing happens on the adjacent cell here and on and on it goes down the line so that cells way removed down the line are in actuality connected through the same cytoplasm in the interior uh, of the adjacent cell next to it of the adjacent cell next to it and of the adjacent cell next to it so when you think about it this interconnectedness of the cytoplasm of these cells really creates a common milieu or a common internal environment uh, amongst all of these cells so that a chemical signal that's generated here in this cell quickly becomes spread to the adjacent cell which quickly becomes spread to the adjacent cell and on down the line these chemicals can diffuse so that the entire population of tendon cells can be exposed to the same chemical signal, even though the chemical signal was generated and uh, produced locally in one tendon cell, it's not very long before that signal propagates and perpetuates down the line so that the entire structure of the tendon is exposed to that same chemical signal. And that chemical signal can be either an anabolic signal to produce uh, a signal that uh, creates a stronger tendon, or it can also be a catabolic signal that results in the degeneration uh, of the tendon. So imagine this, if we're talking about uh, anabolic signals or we're talking about catabolic signals, let's see how those signals can be propagated and perpetuated down the line through these communication uh, networks known as gap junctions. So if you focus your attention on the image to the left, this shows uh, a cross section of normal tendinous tissue. In green here is an elongated tenocyte cell. Here's the cell nucleus uh, within the green cytoplasm of the tenocyte cell. Red here is depicting the plasma membrane, the phospholipid bilayer. Uh, of this tendon cell. And then in the extracellular matrix, we have these collagen fibers, sort of in a relaxed tendon, you can see that these collagen fibers are sort of assuming a wavy, not taut or tight appearances, appearance, but they are oriented uh, somewhat linearly. Well, when this tendon comes under stretch, such as depicted here in this image, all of these collagen fibers become stretched and taut and tight and shear forces, shearing forces are imposed upon the cell membranes of the tenocyte cell. So this image here depicts a tendon cell subject to shearing forces. On the other hand, this image here depicts a tendon cell being subject to compressive forces, compressive forces. So for example, where could a tendon cell be exposed to compressive forces? 
Well, how about the patellar tendon? As the patellar tendon projects over the tibial plateau uh, in the flexed knee. Imagine uh, someone jumping or imagine a weightlifter doing squats and descending into the bottom position of squats. As uh, the knee goes into increasing angles of knee flexion, the patellar tendon is stretched across the tibial plateau and the tendon cell is subject to compressive forces across the tibial plateau. So this is depicting a, a tendon cell being squished and compressed and uh, squeezed into tighter and tighter spaces. And again, the collagen fibers, uh, because they're under tension, are arranged linearly. Well, what we see in these three diagrams is one single tendon cell. But if we strip away the collagen matrix and expose only the tendon cells, we're going to see that the tendon cells are connected to each other through these connexon gap junctions. And there is cell-to-cell uh, -cell communication such that the signals generated by these tensile forces and the signals generated by these compressive forces can be transmitted to adjacent cells down the line so that the entirety of the tendon is exposed to the same chemical signals. So here we have a normal tendon. This could be, for example, the bicep tendon or the supraspinatus tendon or the patellar tendon. Okay, and let's take a little biopsy here out of the center of this tendon structure. And when we do take a biopsy out, we get exactly what we saw on the previous slide. We have tendon cells embedded in extracellular collagenous matrix. And this is showing uh, sort of a relaxed alignment of the collagen fibers. So we know that this tendon cell is not under any particular tension. Now, if we uh, treat this tendon uh, with some protease material to remove all the collagen fibers from the uh, tissue itself, we're left with the interconnected cellular uh, structures. So here is an elongated tendon cell. Here's the cell nucleus here. And what this diagram is depicting is it's depicting these little tiny gap junction connections that connect cells to cells. So where cells come into contact with each other, there are those integrated proteins, those connexon proteins that create gap junctions from cell to cell to cell. And I, I want you to imagine this taking place all down the line and all down the length of this tendon from the myotendinous junction here to the enthesis where the tendon attaches onto bone here. So imagine that we have uh, an anabolic signal. Uh, let's imagine that we have uh, an examinee, he has a tendinopathy, and he's in therapy and we're administering some exercise therapy to rehabilitate uh, uh, the injured tendon tissue. Well, an anabolic signal through either a tensile or a compressive force is created here in this local tenocyte. Maybe this is uh, an Achilles tendon or it's a tendon of the extensor uh, digitorum at the elbow. Well, the anabolic chemical signal is produced intracellularly here in the local tenocyte. But through these gap junctions, that anabolic signal, those chemical signals, can pass to the next cell, into the next cell, into the next cell, and into the next cell, and in this way, propagate along the entirety of the tendon to produce an anabolic building, building up of the tendon uh, throughout the length of the tendon. So here in our next diagram, it shows the spreading of this anabolic signal through these red dots, which are supposed to represent uh, calcium in this case, or uh, also inositol phosphate which are the anabolic uh, signaling chemicals for anabolism. So uh, here we saw that the signal was generated locally. Now we're seeing it spreading to the next cell, 
getting distributed down through the next cell and getting ready to spread into the next cell. And here we see that anabolic signal propagating and perpetuating itself throughout the entirety of the cellular network within the tendon tissue. Now, this also applies to degenerative signals because tendons can go through catabolism and can degenerate and deteriorate. So a tendon injury creating catabolic chemical messengers here would also quickly spread throughout the entirety of the tendon to cause a degeneration of the entire tendon. And this is important in understand, understanding how these degenerative tendinopathies develop. And we'll talk more about uh, how the cells undergo degenerative processes in tendinopathies as we uh, go on in this program. Now, in addition to cells, all connective tissues have some uh, consistency, some quantity, and some makeup of fibers. And there's three main types of fibers that we see throughout the populations of connective tissues. So, for example, there are collagen fibers, there are elastic fibers, and there are reticular fibers. And the various types of connective tissues have varying concentrations of each of these fibers. So collagen fibers are thick fibers that provide tensile strength. So we can expect to see a high percentage of collagen fibers in those connective tissues that need to have resistance to stretch and strain, such as tendons and ligaments. <coughs> Elastic fibers uh, are long, thin fibers that allow stretch and recoil. So we're, we can expect to see high populations of elastic fibers in those connective tissues that are required to have some stretch and have some recoil back to normal position after the stretch stimulus has been released. So for example, we'll see high percentages of elastic fibers in cartilage tissue, cartilage connective tissue. And then finally, uh, the reticular fibers are short, fine fibers that uh, are found wrapping uh, blood vessels and wrapping around and suspending the soft tissues of or organs. Now, tendons we're going to see are mostly type 1 collagen fibers. They have very few, if any, elastic fibers. They have very few, if any, reticular fibers. But uh, cartilage, on the other hand, will have a lower percentage of collagen fibers and a higher percentage of elastic fibers. And the other connective tissues of the body, such as bone, such as blood, such as adipose, are going to have different percentages of each of these different types of fibers. But tendon fibers are mostly type 1 collagen and we're going to see in degenerative tendons degenerative tendons the type 1 collagen fibers uh, get replaced with a weaker and less mature type 3 collagen fibers now in addition to cells and fibers all connective tissues have some quantity and some consistency of ground substance or extracellular matrix now, the extracellular matrix itself is made up of three different types of components. Number one is interstitial or tissue fluid. This helps fill the space between cells with fluid. And various connective tissues will have differing quantities of interstitial fluid. For example, bone will have very little interstitial fluid, whereas cartilage, the more spongy, flexible cartilage, uh, matrix will have a higher percentage of interstitial fluid. Now, ground substance also has adhesion proteins which connect the cells, the connective tissue cells, whether we're talking about tenocytes, whether we're talking about osteocytes, whether we're talking about chondrocytes, the adhesion proteins connect the cells to the matrix. This is going to be important in our understanding of tendons because the adhesion proteins connect the tendon cells, the tenocytes, 
to the cartilage fibers, such that when the cartilage fibers undergo stress, when they undergo strain, when they undergo compression, those forces that are generated in the fibers can be transmitted to the cells through these adhesion integrin proteins. And in this way, these forces can create chemical signals within the cells. And we talked about both anabolic and catabolic signals within the cells. These, these anabolic and catabolic signals are generated through these adhesion proteins. And then finally, the ground substance is composed of some quantity and some consistency uh, of proteoglycans and glycosaminoglycans, also referred to as GAGs, glycosaminoglycans. Uh, and it's these chemicals, these uh, protein and uh, carbohydrate chemicals that determine the consistency of the matrix. So connective tissues that have high percentage of proteoglycans and glycosaminoglycans are going to have more flexible matrix such as cartilage. Whereas other connective tissues such as bone and such as tendon have lower percentage of uh, proteoglycans and glycosaminoglycans are going to have a less flexible structure. So let's take a look at some of these uh, glycosaminoglycans. Okay, so here's a diagram of the chemical composition of a typical glycosaminoglycan. And the glycosaminoglycan is composed of uh, linking proteins and backbone core proteins to which these proteoglycan side chains are attached. These proteoglycan side chains are composed of various structures, some of which are known as keratin sulfates, some are known as chondro chondroitin sulfates. You may have also heard of glucosamine sulfate. And this provides the basis for the glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate uh, nutrition supplements that are recommended for uh, patients who have uh, degeneration of the cartilage connective tissues of the body. So for example, arthritis sufferers take glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate supplements, the theory and philosophy of which is that uh, taking those two substances helps provide the building blocks and the materials for the construction of new and better uh, proteoglycans and glucosa, uh, glucose, uh, glucosaminoglycans, the GAGs, in order to help build up the matrix of the degenerative cartilages of the arthritic joints. Now, the various connective tissues are going to have varying quantities of these glycosaminoglycan uh, GAG structures in the ground substance. So in tendon structure, we're going to see very little of these glycosaminoglycans compared to cartilage structure, which is going to have more and a higher percentage of these glycosaminoglycans. Now, an interesting chemical feature of these glycosaminoglycans is that these end chains uh, attract water, attract fluid. So connective tissues that have high quantities of glycosaminoglycans are more fluid than connective tissues that have a relative paucity uh, or low percentage of these glycosaminoglycans. So this explains why cartilage <clears throat> is more uh, aqueous, is more spongy, is more soft, is more uh, elastic and, and uh, recoils more than does tendon tissue because tendon tissue has a relative paucity of these glycosaminoglycans. In fact, tendon, as we're going to see, is mostly is mostly simply composed of uh, type 1 cartilage fibers with very little ground substance and very little of these glycosaminoglycans. But nonetheless, tendon tissue does have glycosaminoglycans. And in degenerative tendinopathy conditions, we see changes 
in these glycosaminoglycan structures. In fact, I'll give you a hint to, to when we get to de degenerative tendinopathies. With degenerative tendinopathies, we see the influx of more and new and additional glycosaminoglycans so that the tendon tissue itself becomes more aqueous, more, more fluid, and more puffy and more thickened. And this uh, increased population and percentage of glycosaminoglycans crowds out some of the cartilage. And so the tendon becomes more aqueous, more fluid, and less resistant to tensile stresses and a weaker tendon overall due to a change in the relationship between the percentage of collagen fibers compared to the uh, amount of glycosaminoglycans. So very fascinating, this anatomy uh, of the tendon structures, because it's interesting, we're going to see degenerative changes occurring in each of the components of the anatomy of the tendon structure. We're going to see degeneration in the cells. We're going to see degeneration in the type and strength of the collagen fibers. And we're going to see degenerative changes also uh, in the ground substance. So we can start putting some of these ideas together uh, by looking at uh, a typical type of connective tissue known as the loose areolar connective tissue. Now, the loose areolar connective tissue is located right beneath the skin. So I want you to take your finger down right around your uh, umbilicus and take a pinch of that tissue on top of your abdominal muscles and get a pinch of the skin and the subcutaneous tissue there. And we're talking there about the loose areolar connective tissue. This is here exactly what it looks like if you could look at it underneath the microscope. So as you pinch that uh, tissue around your umbilicus, imagine uh, the first topmost layer is the epidermis. Below the epidermis is the dermis. And then below the dermis, we have this structure here known as the lucerular connective tissue. And the lucerular connective tissue is where the fat cells are. And fat cells and fatty tissue is a form of connective tissue. And depending upon how much uh, you're able to pinch down there around your umbilicus, you may have... Uh, more and larger adipocytes and more and more fatty cells down there than someone else or perhaps more than what you had uh, when you were a little bit younger. But uh, here's an example of an accessory cell uh, located within this connective tissue. So the principal cell type in this connective tissue, the type of cell that uh, maintains this structure is the fibroblast. So here's the fibroblast cell. Here's another fibroblast cell. So we have cells. This tissue is maintained by the fibroblast cell. We also have some fibers. So here is a collagen fiber. Here's another collagen fiber. Here's another collagen fiber. Here are some of the elastic fibers that gives the skin down there its elasticity, such that when you wiggle your fingers across the skin and deform the skin, it doesn't tear the skin and it returns the skin back to its uh, proper position once you stop rubbing it. And then also uh, here are some of these reticular fibers here in blue that sort of support these uh, cells and sort of act like a hairnet to contain uh, the whole structure. And then in the middle and in amongst all of these fibers and all of these cells, is the ground substance in here. This is where the glycosaminoglycans are located. This is the ground substance or the extracellular matrix here. And in this loose areolar connective tissue, the extracellular matrix, matrix uh, is quite aqueous. It's quite fluid. Uh, it's quite a loose, loosely packed structure. And then uh, imagine in tendons, however, we have a much greater population of collagen fibers. In tendon, the collagen fibers are all arranged linearly side by side in parallel fashion. We have a small percentage of tenocytes scattered uh, intermittently throughout the uh, collagenous structures. And in tendon cells, we have very little to no 
ground substance. In other words, tendons are not very aqueous. They're not very fluid. It's a very tightly packed tissue where most of the ground substance uh, has been squeezed out. So uh, this completes our uh, discussion of the anatomy of the connective tissues. And remember, the take-home messages regarding the anatomy is that all the connective tissues of the body are composed of cells, fibers, and ground substance. And what distinguishes one type of connective tissue from another type of connective tissue has to do with the type of cells found within that connective tissue, it has to do with the type and quantity of fibers, and has to do with the type and consistency of the ground substance. Okay, so now that we know the uh, anatomy of the tendon tissues and the connective tissues in general, uh, let's explore some of the specific types of connective tissue and uh, get into a discussion of the specific types of connective tissue associated with tendons. So connective tissues can be broadly divided into uh, two basic categories, the connective tissue propers, which uh, we will uh, discuss with regards to tendons and ligaments, and then also the special connective tissues. So special connective tissue consists of the reticular connective tissue, adipose tissue, cartilage is one of the special connective tissues, bone is a special connective tissue, and then blood is also one of the special connective tissues. So that only leaves the fibrous connective tissues those are contained within the general category of connective tissue proper. Now, uh, with regards to wound healing, newly vascularized connective tissue that forms in the process of wound healing, this is referred to as granulation tissue, and you may have heard that term in regards to wound healing. Granulation tissue is the product of fibroblasts that produce a disorganized collagen patch across newly healed wounds and then in time granulation tissue uh, becomes organized and collagen fibers become organized into parallel rows and that granulation tissue resolves into normal or uh, regular uh, connective tissue. So let's talk now about the connective tissue proper. Now the connective tissue proper consists of the loose connective tissue and the dense connective tissue. And we saw already an example of loose connective tissue in the form of the loose areolar connective tissue found in the subcutaneous layer of the skin. Now the dense connective tissues can be further uh, subdivided into the dense regular and the dense irregular connective tissues with the difference between those two types simply referring to the arrangement of the collagen fibers, whether those fibers are arranged in a regular parallel fashion or whether they're arranged in an irregular or crisscrossing uh, fashion. So the difference between the loose and the dense connective tissues has to do with the ratio of ground substance to fibrous tissue. So loose connective tissue has much more ground substance and a relative lack of fibrous tissue as we saw in the loose areolar connective tissue, while the reverse, meaning a higher ratio of fibrous tissue to ground substance, is true of the dense connective tissue. So dense regular connective tissue is found in structures such as tendons and ligaments and is characterized by collagen fibers arranged in an orderly parallel fashion, giving it tensile strength in one direction. When you think of tensile strength, think of resistance to stretch. So the Achilles tendon has resistance to stress. The greater resistance to stress a tendon has, the more efficient it is at transferring muscular forces to the bone. So, a, a degenerative uh, tendon loses its tensile strength. It loses its resistance to stretch. It loses its efficiency in being able to transfer muscular forces from the muscle to the bone. 
On the other hand, uh, dense irregular connective tissue provides strength not simply in one direction, but provides strength in multiple directions by its arrangement of fibers in a crisscross random fashion in all directions. And type 1 collagen is the type of collagen uh, found in many forms of connective tissue, such as tendons and ligaments. And it's extremely prevalent in the body. It makes up about 25% of the total protein content of the mammalian or human body. So let's get right to it. The dense regular connective tissue is composed of parallel collagen fibers with only a few elastic fibers, very little uh, extracellular matrix or ground stuff substance, and the major cell type is the fibroblast, which sets up the structure of the tendon, and then the mature cell, the fibrocyte, maintains the structure of the tendon. The function of dense regular connective tissue is to attach muscles to bone in the form of tendons, uh, muscles to other muscles in the form of aponeurosis, and bones to bones in the form of ligaments. So we find this uh, dense regular connective tissue uh, in tendons, in aponeuroses, and then also in ligaments. So let's take a look uh, at this dense regular connective tissue under the microscope. So here we have uh, a photo micrograph of a thousand fold magnification. This is uh, a cross section of a biopsy taken from a tendon. And in this diagram here, they're showing uh, what looks to be like, uh, this looks to be like the bicep tendon here up in the shoulder. Okay, so uh, what we see here is we see the nuclei scattered nuclei of uh, the tendon cells, which are fibroblasts. In tendons, we call them tenocytes. So these are the nuclei uh, of the cells. And then these cells secrete protein products. These protein products are these collagen fibers. So these collagen fibers are the product of messenger RNA that is transcribed on the ribosomes of the rough endoplasmic reticulum and exported from the cell and once outside the cell, extracellular, they become arranged into these linear bundles. So this is showing sort of a wavy arrangement of these bundles. This tells us that this uh, tendon is not under load. It's not under tensile stress. Under tensile stress, these fibers would become linear, linear, and parallel. So uh, dense regular connective tissue is primarily parallel collagen fibers, very few elastin fibers. The major cell type is the fibroblast, and you can see that there's very little ground substance within here. Most of the entirety of this tissue uh, is collagenous. The function of the dense regular connective tissue is to attach muscles to bones or muscles to muscles, attaches bones to bones in the forms of ligaments. And this tissue withstands great tensile stress when pulling a force is applied in one direction, at least as long as the uh, tissue is healthy. When the tissue becomes degenerative, we're going to see changes in the nuclei of these cells. And we're going to see changes in the content and the alignment of these collagen fibers. So here shows a, a diagram of a tendon under a little bit more load. You can see that the collagen fibers are stretched out into a more parallel fashion. There is some minute ground substance noted here in these white areas. That's an aqueous type of signal coming from uh, this image. Here's the nuclei of the fibroblasts, and then here's the collagen fibers. So if this is healthy tendon, and just take a look at it, if this is healthy tendon, what do you think uh, degenerative tendon could look like? Or what do you think degenerative tendon 
would look like. Do you think degenerative tendon is going to have the same number, same number of tendon cells present uh, per square inch as healthy tendon? No, we're going to see uh, a reduction in the number of nuclei in degenerative tendon as the cells undergo cell death, also known as apoptosis. So with degenerative tendons, we see cell death that manifests under the microscope as reduced numbers uh, of fibroblastic nuclei. Also, the collagen fibers we're going to see uh, degenerate. We're going to see the type 1 collagen uh, replaced with weaker, thinner, uh, and less uh, strong type 3 collagen fibers. And we're going to see a, a less parallel arrangement of those fibers. And we're going to see that because of those changes, that uh, tendon is going to be less resistant to tensile stress and more uh, prone to the ultimate tendon injury, which is tendon rupture. So doctors, I hope this helps you. I think it's important to understand the anatomy uh, almost down to the microscopic and uh, cellular level. In fact, uh, I think it's important to understand uh, the origin of these tissues all the way back to the uh, embryologic level. And that's why we take the time uh, to go through uh, this anatomy review with you. And one of the important principles that uh, I want you to start thinking about with regards to the connective tissues in general and tendon tissue specifically is that tendon is dynamic tissue. Tendon, like muscle, responds to forces and stresses and strains. Like muscles, tendons fortify themselves and undergo anabolism when stresses and strains are appropriate, when stresses and strains are proper. We know also that bone, being one of the connective tissues, also responds to stresses and strains. And let me remind you of what you probably learned as Wolf's Law, which uh, tells us that bone aligns itself along the forces of stress and strain. So we know that bone is dynamic tissue. We know that muscles which connect to bone is dynamic tissue. Well, tendons which connect the muscles to the bones are also dynamic tissue. And like bones and like muscles, tendons undergo anabolism or building up or fortification when stresses and strains and loads are appropriate and proper, but they undergo catabolism or degenerative changes when stresses and strains and loads are inappropriate and are improper and are excessive. And in the uh, presence of uh, inappropriate loads and in the presence of injury, unfortunately with tendons, because of the cell to cell communications through the gap junctions, Im improper loading and injury chemical mediators quickly spread from cell to cell to propagate a degenerative signal. Now, in the absence of proper treatment of these conditions, which is difficult to find in this day and age because the proper treatments for tendinopathies are only now being elucidated uh, and clarified within the last 10 years. In other words, the evidence-based medical treatment programs for tendinopathies is only now uh, being uh, discovered. So it's difficult to uh, find proper treatment programs for these degenerative tendinopathy conditions. And so in the industrial setting, that sets the stage for chronic degenerative changes. And we're gonna go into chronic degenerative changes in our next session. We'll talk about the stages of tendinopathy. Important for us now is to realize that in the industrial setting and in the California workers' compensation system, tendinopathies have a high likelihood of becoming chronic and a high likelihood of resulting in permanent impairment. So with chronic degenerative tendinopathies, many injured workers will never fully recover and never fully return to pre-injury condition. And so it's important that you be familiar with the tendinopathies and how to provide for permanent impairments for examinees suffering from these conditions. And we'll develop those topics in our very next sessions. 
So for now, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I want to thank you for uh, joining me on today's video. I look forward to being with you on our very next video as well as we continue with our ongoing series entitled Permanent Impairments of the Tendinopathies. For now, I'm wishing you best of success in your career as a qualified medical evaluator.